Hi, I'm Tom Zimmerman from EMDR's Third Weekend. EMDR's Third Weekend is a site where you can get a lot of resources that are very helpful in working with clients with complex trauma. It is the information that may be most helpful if you're an EMDR therapist after your part two training. It may be exactly the kind of thing that we may have included in a third weekend of training if we had it. You also do not need to be an EMDR therapist in order to join EMDR's third weekend. Therapists of any type are welcome to join. There may be many, many things that you can learn about trauma um, from that site and treating trauma from that site. So this episode is about containing and all of the things associated with containment. Um, containing is a central trauma strategy. Um, we all do it. Uh, we are designed to do it. So we want to think about containment being a little bit more broad than basically the standard Shapiro container resources. So again, this episode is about understanding um, what we're doing when we're containing um, and leveraging that understanding to help clients develop strategies and perhaps even rituals, right, to to get stuff that um, that may be in awareness, um, put in a place that, that may be a little bit easier to carry. So long story short, containers may help us expedite the process of returning difficult content back to the limbic brain. So uh, many people with complex trauma, if we think about awareness uh, kind of being like a library, they may have certain volumes, they may have certain whole shelves of content um, off the shelves and in awareness, kind of sitting, you know, flipping through different pages. What a container does, what a container resource does, is it may be a kind of ritual that lets you return content back to the shelf where you got it from in the limbic brain. Because most of the time, when we do check out material from the limbic brain, we interact with it. We don't actually do anything productive with it. <laughs> we just get it out, um, bring it into awareness. It causes one kind of catastrophe or another. Um, and I think probably throughout a good chunk of human history, this has been what humans, um, humans have done. So again, containers may make what we may normally do in this long of, you know, a period of time, something that may make this a much shorter period of time. So in the way I think Shapiro, Dr. Shapiro conceptualized containers is as an almost cognitive strategy, right? Or definitely a visualization strategy, but maybe a cognitive strategy. But it's a cognitive strategy that has the intention to not engage. It is a, it's a strategy associated with the intention, setting the intention. I'm not going to engage with this right here, right now. Part of what I want to say is that is that a container can also be a somatic strategy because a lot of activation isn't just cognitive. It isn't just the things we're seeing, but it may be the feeling that we have as a result of all that activation. And, and again, we want to we want to address all of the different aspects, kind of cognitive, visual, somatic, when we're thinking about containing, because if we leave or neglect certain parts, certain parts of activation can cause other parts to activate. So containers can be a very helpful ritual in pivoting away from activation. It's a ritual that signifies something to parts as well, okay? But the reasons why we container matter and the reasons what we're up to matters. And many, many problems with containment, regardless of how you approach it, come from the assumptions that clients make about what containment means, what containment means to current functioning, what containment means related to their past and what we do with their past, and what containment means related to their recovery. So it's not unusual for when I'm talking about, you know, developing a containment resource for a client to say or us to have to deal with a part of the client um, 
saying something like the following. Wait a minute, Tom. I just want to make sure I have this straight. I've locked this stuff up all of my life. I come to see you to get it out, and now you're telling me to do something that I'm coming to you to, for you to help me stop doing, right? So what we want to communicate is that we're not containing for just any reasons. We're containing for very, very specific reasons. So the why we are containing is important. Our motivation, our intention behind what we're containing are important. So I want to list some reasons, right? These are reasons that we might container for good, healthy, adaptive reasons. Um, container some content that has been activated. So one of the reasons why we might want to container, and if we do, we want to build that as something that's good, healthy, adaptive, is we have a recognition that we've been trying to solve something using strategies that aren't very effective. So again, we want to talk about rumination and how rumination may not have the best track record for dealing with, for dealing with things. Um, rumination may allow a lot of memories, cognitions, themes to connect. Again, rumination is really good at just pulling out other, other content. Um, we can container and should be free, you know, to container without feeling bad about it at all if right now is simply not a good time to try to resolve the issue or the problem. So if we're checking out at, at a grocery store, now may not be a really good time to try to solve something um, um, in the present. Also, we should feel free to container, right? Try to not let ourselves beat ourselves up. Um, we should feel free to container when the issue that is coming up is intruding on our ability to function, right? Because once something is coming in at a level that's making it difficult for us to function, we kind of need to contain it because once, I mean, we have to do this work from the, from the, from the footing of stability. So, um, and again, if anything is contributing to current instability, it may really make, it really may be a good idea to put that stuff uh, away for the, for the current moment. Also, what we want to do is introduce um, the idea that the client can, anytime they want, um, direct their attention to what uh, they want to, right? So in some ways, containment can be an exercise of client control over what is getting their attention at any one moment. So sometimes something may happen that will cause some activation, things may come up, and almost these processes may hijack us. So purposeful reason containment to, to not attend to something right here, right now, can be a very important uh, exercise and agency about what we're going to attend to in this moment and what we're going to defer. Um, because this is really important as humans. We are not wired to attend to everything, past, present, and future, all in this single moment. In a lot of ways, we want to introduce the idea of containment as the beginning of stability. Containment is also about what we're doing right here, right now. Containment is a decision right here, right now, not to give our attention to something, not to engage with something on purpose and for the right reasons. Containment can be the beginning of stability or containment can introduce the possibility of a little bit of stability. So we want to emphasize the reasons why it's okay to container. And one of the biggest, broadest reasons that we want to, that we want to stress is that we have a plan. We have a plan to deal with these issues. We just have to deal with them in a structured and orderly way. 
The other metaphor that I use is sometimes one of the things that really, really stinks about being a person who, who is carrying the trauma that was done to you is that sometimes we have to be both the jail, you know, that we, we are the, the, the kind of structure that is carrying this stuff, and we also have to be the jailer. So we cannot have everything that is contained loose. That is an invitation for a riot. So we, unfortunately, we have to be both the jail and the jailer, but we have a plan. We have a plan, one piece at a time, using a transformational psychotherapy to get information out and resolved, one piece, one chunk at a time. Okay, now, clients and client parts will often propose ways of containment that other parts, maybe not in this moment, but other parts later may have some problems with. So as we're developing, as we're developing containers, some clients will say, why can't we use a diaper genie? Right? If you don't know what a diaper genie is, it's this, this handy little device that you put a diaper in, you twist it a few times, and then you have a, a kind of a clean space to put the next diaper in um, as, you're, as you're cleaning it. The problem is um, diaper genie, we don't ever go through the diaper genie, right? The diaper genie is essentially a trash can. It's a kind of self-resetting trash can. So other clients will want to use a rocket. Can't we just put this stuff on a rocket and send it to, you know, send it to the moon, send it to Mars, send it out into the universe? Um, to which I'll say yes, as long as we have a way to retrieve the rocket. Because what is what we are sending away, what we are putting into the container, is something um, that will not be buried. Right? It is something that we can't. And, and again, parts of us will want to incinerate it. Parts of, us, parts of us will want to put it in a trash can or explode it. The things we carry are things we carry because they won't let go of us. Right? It's what trauma is. Trauma isn't about the things you can't let go of. It's things that won't let go of you. It's like that tar on the inside. So the other thing we want to talk about with containment is containment in many ways is one of the best adaptations uh, of human evolution. The limbic brain itself is a container. And when you have PTSD, that's a problem but it's also an, an enormous advantage because the, the limbic brain as a container holds stuff, keeps stuff out of awareness. Some things will come into awareness, but what I often will tell my clients is that the reason we're not all in the psychiatric hospital all of the time is because of the containering qualities of the limbic brain. So. Humans are information processing systems, and when we encounter information that we can't assimilate, either because at the time we're too shut down, we're too overwhelmed, or we simply don't have the needed adaptive information at that time for it to link up with, it's helpful to have a place to put it until we can try again to assimilate it. So clients often come to us with a lot of ambivalence about all this stuff that they're carrying. On one hand, they've consciously and unconsciously tried to process this, right? I mean, I think, show me someone with, with trauma who hasn't tried to process that information using the skills and assets and cultural resources that they have for all of their lives. Um, almost all of those strategies have been incredibly ineffective strategies. Um, in our cultures, right, the cultures that wound us, our best cultural intuitions related to how to actually process trauma are terrible and ineffective and often result in more wounding. So on one hand, we have this history of trying to solve trauma. On the other hand, we have these, this whole lifetime of very bad visceral experiences from trying to do that. Okay. So on one hand, we try to interact, and on the other, we're trying to not interact with the containered information. So containering, when we introduce this idea of containering, 
we need to understand that it's not a neutral activity. Asking a client to simply let go of information that is both existentially salient on one hand and intractable on the other is not an easy or neutral task. Everything that we container, past interactions with the container, past strategies in trying to process trauma, and in fact, um, you know, all of the stuff that we're carrying that needs to be containered are all implicated in what makes containment exercises really difficult for many clients with complex trauma. And whether we realize it or not, we often have a visual bias in our containment approaches. So what I mean by that is, you know, container is a visualization exercise at its core. There's a container that we, we try to imagine. We have to kind of see information go into the container. Um, so since at its core, um, and the way it's practiced most commonly, container is a visualization resource, it is helpful to assess whether your clients find these types of visualizations helpful. And if they don't, it's very important to help them develop some accommodations to that. So again, Containment is a metaphor, right? It, it's also a ritual. It's this thing we do. Ideally, we do it and we do it and we do it, and then our parts consent to it, right? So the, the result of it, limbic brain getting put back up, can come from simply the ritual of seeing books be returned. To the shelf in the limbic brain from which we from which we got them. Um, since container is a metaphor, since visualizations are metaphors also, um, uh, it's important to realize that a lot of people don't intuitively understand metaphor. They may not know what you mean by see that go into that container, or they may not know what you mean by spin that container around in your awareness and notice what it's made of. Um, and a lot of people may not get the kind of visual ritual aspects of this. So part of the reason clients may really struggle with visualization parts is, I mean, some people are born with difficulties visualizing. But if we want to appreciate how hard it is for many clients with complex trauma, to do this type of creative visualization, we need to develop a little bit of capacity for understanding how hard their brains are running all the time to keep them safe. And I, I'm gonna invite you to try this little exercise, okay? So if your mind is pretty quiet, containment may be a pretty easy task. Visualizing it, you know, seeing things, you know, experimenting may be a pretty easy thing to do. So what I would like you to imagine is on one hand counting down from 10 to 0. And while you're doing that, on the other, subtract that number from 10. So 10 minus 10 is 0. Okay, 10 minus 9 is 1. So do this, you know, do this kind of concurrently. And while you're doing that, while you're trying to do that task, Imagine a calm scene of a beach. Try to imagine the waves. Try to imagine the seagulls, the sand, the sky, sun, cloud, sands. And also, just for fun, try to do this with all of your eyes open, you know, with your eyes open, because closing your eyes may make anxiety or make disconnection from what we're trying to do in the present even more, more difficult. So, our clients' minds with complex trauma are running very, very hard all of the time to keep them safe. It's really hard to do creative tasks when our nervous system thinks it's at war. Again, very few of the great works of literature in the 20th century were, were written in the trenches of Europe. It's just really, really hard to engage in creative tasks in a war zone. There's a podcast episode on EMGR's third weekend that focuses on accommodations you can make when, the, when clients struggle to visualize, visualize. These accommodations include using actual containers, 
my containers in the office with an actual lid that they can you know viscerally handle and or outsourcing the visualization of the container to videos or photos so again there's a podcast that walk podcast episode that walks through um, when clients struggle to visualize in, in EMDR or in flash therapy. Sometimes the problem with visualization isn't related to the container itself, but in identifying what to container. Okay, so uh, trying to find the handle. So we're containing stuff, right? When we ask the client, can you kind of scoop that up and see it go into your container? The client may not have a handle on what to grab and scoop okay so one of the things one of the places that the stress might show up or that things we need to container might show up might be in the body so um and we need to attend to that because if we don't body-based activation may cause rumination to start up again so um in the four blinks version of flash um incorporated into the script there is this shop vac resource and i would like you to try this with me i'll invite you to try this resource with me we're only going to do it for a very short period of time but um, the way i introduce this resource is i'm asking i'm asking you have you ever used a shop vac a handheld vacuum if you haven't have you ever um, use the vacuum cleaner at the car wash where you drop some quarters in um, and vacuumed out vacuumed out your car. So what I would invite you to do very quickly is just scan your body. See if there's any distress in your body. If you can find any kind of, you know, not pressure, tension, movement, heaviness, emptiness anywhere in your body, um, I would invite you to kind of drop some quarters in to the shop vac right or flip the little toggle switch um, on your shop vac and um, and just notice right just notice that vacuum sensation and kind of move it over right I, I encourage clients to use movement kind of move it over wherever that tension may be and see if you can see the gunk right that stress if you can see that stress as a kind of colored smoke leaving you going into that shop vac hose and into the container of the vacuum uh, of the vacuum uh, you know container itself okay so try that see if that see if that doesn't uh, see if that isn't helpful um, sometimes we need to modify we may need to put a little bit of a screen over the shop vac hose if it's pulling too hard so that it doesn't pull you know parts of the body um, into the container so attending to the body when containing can be very very important one of the things i also like to do when working with clients of complex trauma is that many times we may try to contain our trauma but the moment we've developed this very tentative um, container resource so i like to test the container but i do not like to test the container using actual trauma I like to test the container using something innocuous like a business card or a slip of paper. So testing the container using something that is neutral is one of the strategies that's built into the Four Blinks version of Flash. And it can give, it can give us some confidence that containment works. So again, the way we're doing this is we're seeing this, this business card, the slip of paper, go into the container we're seeing the door close and we're just asking the client does it feel like that thing you put in there is in there does it feel like if you were to open it would you see this business card sitting on the bottom of your container good so that's a way to test the container without a very strong risk of something bad happening good I also want to point out that if we conceptualize containment being broader, being a broader category than simply the Shapiro containment resources, if we think about containment in a more broad, we think about what we're actually doing when we're containing, 
then there may be ways to do it other than the standard Shapiro resources. And I really like thinking about sensory grounding as a containment strategy, right? In the sense that a lot of rumination and trauma activation happen in this abstracted, right? Almost partially dissociated state um, in which we're, it's a little bit of the past, a little bit of the present, a little bit of the future, but it's happening up here. It's not really happening in a connected present right here, right now in this moment state. So one of the things that can be very, very helpful in helping stuff get recontainered is finding our way into the safety of the present. And again, safety is in quotes because we realize that many, many clients with complex trauma do not have a felt sense of safety anywhere. But very often, right here, right now, is a much safer place than in the worst parts of the past, which may be activated, or in the worst worries of the future. So finding our way into the, the, the more safety of the present can help create conditions that can allow material to find its way back into the containers or onto the shelves where they need to be in the limbic brain. Sensory grounding can also help us briefly escape the processes that may be feeding activation. And even if you don't really understand what I'm getting at by sensory grounding being a way, being in a lot of ways, being a containment exercise in and of itself, sensory grounding is a very good way to transition to containment, to make sure that we have enough footing in the present to increase the chances that containment will work you know, effectively, um, at least for a while. Okay, many clients will tell us that these resources we're introducing to them don't work for them. And we want to be respectful. We always want to be respectful when a client says something doesn't work for me. And what we really want to do is if the client is telling you that something doesn't work for them, but you're asking them to do it anyway, please, please find a way to do it that's different than the 27 ways they've been taught it before. And you're going to want to help them identify what the difficulty is that makes them believe or makes them certain that these resources don't work for them. So when something happens with a resource, the client's telling you something doesn't work, this is not a failure. There's information in it. And in a lot of ways, the, the beauty in resourcing isn't that they work all the time. The beauty is in the information that comes up as the client is negotiating and trying on these resources. Resourcing is probably where you're going to learn the most about how the client's nervous system functions. So when clients have a problem, when clients have problems with containment, I promise you there's information in it. So when a client says something doesn't work, are they saying that it doesn't work because I have to keep doing it, meaning it doesn't stay containered? And if that's the case, we need to be prepared to normalize that. Absolutely. Is it possible that you may be grabbing a piece of it and containing it, but other parts of it may be still out in awareness. And if other parts of it are still out in awareness, that may cause you to go grab that, that book that you just put on the shelf um, in very, very little time. Also, as a ritual, containment is for clients with complex trauma, we need to simply normalize that what we're doing is we're putting this issue away for now. And what now means is this literal moment. What containment means is that we're putting it away for now. We're not putting it away for five minutes from now, five days from now, five, you know, five years from now. The containment is a ritual to disengage from something in the present. Okay. The other problem with containment with many, many clients, with many, many container scripts is that 
if someone relatively healthy needs to container something, they probably have the handles. It is probably one particular thing that has grabbed hold of them and seeped into awareness. It's not everything. It's not all of the stuff. It's not 27 volumes of information from 14 different shelves. So when content seeps into awareness with a client with a client with a client with complex trauma, very often rumination starts. So once rumination starts, all kinds of things come into awareness. So they don't have one thing to container. We say, I want you to kind of container that thing. What is that thing? There may not be a handle or a perspective from which they're able to grab it and container it. So one of the very important things we can do is we may need to help them identify fragments of it to container. Is there a particular piece of this that we can identify that we can container, right? So it's easier to container fragments at a time over and over and over for many people than it is to container whole themes, right? Whole lifelong themes, particularly when those themes connect to core needs. So we need to show clients how to container chunks of it, pieces of it, aspects of it, including aspects that may be, may be in the body. So I'm hoping some part of this is helpful, some part of this is useful. Um, container and containment is bigger. Uh, it's a bigger concept, it's a bigger construct, it's a bigger resource um, than the standard Shapiro containment resources. So learning how to work with and help clients leverage the natural containering processes of our nervous system can be very, very, very helpful. They're very helpful in promoting client agency, promoting client um, choice, and particularly choice related to what I am choosing to give to my give my attention to right here, right now in the present. And what I'm choosing, because I'm working with someone who can help me transform, fully adaptively transform this stuff, what is okay right here, right now to put out of awareness? What is it that's okay right here, right now to defer so that I can become stable enough to do some really deep healing one piece at a time? So thank you for joining. Again, I hope some part of this was helpful. Um, visit EMDR Third Weekend, where we have uh, resources for all kinds of ways to approach standard resources in non-standard ways. So thank you for coming. Thanks for joining. And uh, thanks for all of the good work that you do in the world.